Thanks, Guy. I have no problem embarrassing myself, so I don't need any help in that area. But uh, a little tight up here. Well, uh, look. Uh, good morning to all of you, and thanks for gathering here. And in fact, I always say we've we've gathered the finest minds in logistics in this room this morning, which should either give you great confidence or scare the living crap out of you, because this is all we got. But uh, I just got back from a weekend of golf with my uh, college buddies down at Myrtle Beach, so I'm a little uh, froggy this morning, but uh, used to be when we went on these trips, we bought a six-pack of beer. Everybody had a great time. Now we're buying six-packs of Motrin, so I'm bitching and moaning about it. But again, let me thank AUSA, certainly General Sullivan, uh, Guy Swan, General Lou Wagner. Sir, always good to see you, former AMC commander. Let me also uh, thank Jim Dubik. Jim, where are you at? I saw him earlier. Jim was uh, my division commander. I can call him Jim now, but he was my division commander in the great Tropic Lightning 25th ID. Probably one of the smartest guys I've ever been around. I read his articles in the AUSA publications. Just a, a uh, incredible mind. Uh, one day we were talking when I was his discom commander, and he said, Ray, he says, you really need to study chaos theory. And I thought he was talking about my discom. You know, we had a lot of chaos down. I didn't know what the hell all that was about, but that's the kind of guy he is. Let me also just thank the industry partners. Absolutely incredible what you have accomplished through my 35 years in career in the Army, but certainly the past 12 years of combat, the longest war in our nation's history. I mean, you think what has been accomplished, and just reflect on that, a lot of, you know, both the, the Vice and General Sullivan and Guy talked about it. We, we don't take credit for that because it's just not kind of in our nature. But you do need to reflect on it ever so often. And, and I'll point to two things that I think really illustrate the incredible accomplishments. One, and I was the R sent four at the time, so I watched this magnificent thing unfold, and that was the up armoring of vehicles in the 05 to 06 time frame. I mean, Kevin Leonard, who I replaced there in R sent, began that process. But we basically took about 50,000 vehicles, thin skinned vehicles, and up armored them. Some of them had some, you know, different armor they'd slapped on the side of it. And this was done while in contact, while in combat, kind of the NASCAR pit stop operations, pulling the vehicles down off the, uh, off the gun line armoring at night, uh, the, again, the industrial base that did that. There are literally thousands of Americans walking around today alive because of the work that was done by the American industrial base, and my hat's off to you. The second one I would illustrate is the, the closure of the Pack g lock, and I'll talk about that. I've really only got two slides, so I won't burn too much green light up here, but the closure of the Pack g lock, um, we actually got greener in all of our logistics metrics when the PAC G lock closed. I mean, think about that. Here we are, a landlocked country. Uh, we've got our main route to come in, you know, through Karachi up through the two, the two gates. Yes, there's the Northern Distribution Network, and that's, a, that's a, obviously a, it's a capillary compared to the artery of the PAC G lock. It gets closed. All the statistics go greener because we focused on it as both military and industrial base. And, of course, the Air Force, incredible, and our commercial lift partners just made it happen. Uh, that is a testament uh, to, again, the, the incredible innovation and adaptability. I would offer one caution, though. Just think about if the enemy had started shooting down commercial aircraft with ground-to-air missiles. Now, that would have changed the dynamic, and I'll talk just briefly about that. You know, to me, that rivals uh, the World, World War II example of incredible logistics, which is the Red Ball Express. And we all kind of grew up as kids, you know, hearing about that. Somebody needs to write a book about that kind of capability that was done in the last 12 years. I also want to thank, uh, again, the joint team that's here. You'll see on a lot of these panels, we really made an effort. Guy Swan worked it to uh, bring in a number of our joint partners from the joint staff, from DLA, other folks. So uh, it's, it really gives that flavor because, again, a theme through all of this is all about the Log Nation. You know, I don't know if Ken Dowd invented it. Uh, but it is a, it's a great example and it's a great statement about how powerful this logistics nature is. And certainly I see a lot of our coalition partners out there, so thanks to all that. Um, and and <clears throat> Guy again mentioned this, very cautious about this issue of tooth to tail. Look, I clearly understand we want the pointy end of the spear and more trigger pullers and all that kind of stuff. I got it. But this thing by just saying, look, we'll just reduce the tail, we'll just reduce the tail, reduce the tail. It's all about risk. How much risk are you willing to take? And what's the trade-off here? There's lots of innovation things we can do to try to reduce down that tail, but just cutting it and taking out capability before you put in a mitigation process and solution set, it just increases risk. So 
So yeah, because it, it's about demand and it's about trust and it's about all those kinds of things. So again, that'll be a theme as I talk through these things. Another caution is I saw it on a slide the other day and it's beginning to creep back into our lexicon again. And it's all about reducing the tail. Just in time logistics. Okay, here's my analogy of just in time logistics. You kill the last bad guy with the last bullet available. That's perfect, efficient logistics, right? That's just in time. And there's people that like to drive us there. You know, to me, they want to get us all about business practices. My point is the closer you get to the head knocking area, you know, the FIBA, the FLOT, those, some of those old terminologies, the less business practices we need. Now, there's a place for business practice. Don't get me wrong. I got it. Certainly in the industrial base, certainly as you convert from strategic to operational logistics, but the closer you get where people are fighting and dying, business practices don't make sense. And just-in-time logistics, in my mind, is a dangerous thing. But there are money people and there's programmers that want to drive us there. Now, we don't want the other end of the spectrum, which is just-in-case logistics, solving everything with mass. And we tend to do that. We did it in Desert Storm. We actually did it in the beginning of uh, OIF. You know, there was two metrics that General Franks had to make the decision to cross the, uh, the berm. One was, believe it or not, how much fuel he had to ground. He wanted 90 days of fuel on the ground. The second one might surprise you. Some of you may be aware of this. Was he wanted to have sufficient 5590 batteries. We were short at the industrial base on batteries, believe it or not. And one of the things we've got to figure out is how to reduce down a reliance through operational energy on batteries and, that, and those things. But again, that may be through mass, but where is that, where is that point? Uh, next slide. The vice laid most of this out. So the only thing I would talk about on here is that what's in that cloud. And these are the unique competencies, perhaps comparative advantages that the, that the chief would point to. Leadership. Mobility. When we talk about mobility, we're talking about from the strategic level all the way down to the tactical. Now, here's something, and I mentioned this to General Solomon, that concerns me about mobility. This past year, OSD led the mobility capability study. Now, that's a change. It used to be the mobility requirement study. Now, think about that. When you do a mobility capability study, all you're saying is I got X amount of ships, I got X amount of uh, airplanes, X amount of commercial capability, that's what we got, and then how does the strategy meet that? You kind of back into it. A mobility requirement study says here's what we need, here's what we got, what's that gap, and then how do we fill it? It's how we got the MRS, Miss Burrow, mobility requirement study, bottoms up review, that's how we got the C-17, that's how we got the LMSRs, it's how we got a lot of our deployment infrastructure. This was done kind of coming out of Desert Storm, as you remember. There was a whole amount of investment in that. We are really, really marginally investing in strategic mobility and even operational mobility, I would, I would argue, and I'll talk a little bit about that. But that is a huge risk area. So we've got to, and, and so we've worked with OSD and the joint staff, and, and hopefully we're going to do another mobility requirement study. We'll, we'll see where that comes. Last thing you see down there is theater logistics at all echelons that the, that the chief and the secretary talk about. And again, the vice talked about that. The capabilities that the Army brings to the COCOM commanders, if you think about it, at the ASCC level COCOMs, it's theater ballistic missile defense, those kind of capabilities. It's theater signal, it's theater medical, and fourth one I would add is theater logistics. There's not another service, and I'm not being overly parochial here, but yeah, I am. Those four capabilities, no other service provides. It is unique. It's comparative advantage. And it's key capabilities that the COCOM commanders want. The premier all-volunteer army. You read the pundits after we came out of the Vietnam War and we went out away from the draft to the all-volunteer army. Most of the pundits at that time said that if the United, Nation, the United States ever got into protracted conflict, and most of them said that the protracted conflict was about six months, that we would have to go back to the draft. The nation could not sustain an all-volunteer force. Well, they've been proven completely wrong, just like those three examples the vice had. Here we are, 12 years of combat, an incredible all-volunteer force, but it is not an expensive. It's a, it is a relatively expensive force in terms of compensa compensation and pay, retirement, medical. That's why the, the, all the services are trying to figure out. The costs are escal escalating like this, just like they are for health care for the average citizen of our nation. It is becoming unaffordable. So how can you do that? So there's got to be some give and take in there, and, it's, and they're working their way through that. 
But uh, it's an incredible all-volunteer force. I think all of us in this room would agree with that. Next slide. So I'll just briefly hit this because the I actually have three slides. I lied. The next slide is really my, the meat of it. So OEF retrograde, which I spent a lot of time on. Um, we've got about $15 billion worth of stuff on the ground in Afghanistan. A year ago, we had almost $30 billion on the ground. A lot of that's come back. Our partners at DLA, Ted Case is sitting out there, Mark Karnacek's coming, uh, have done a miraculous job of taking care of all the stuff we want to get rid of. So of that $15 billion sitting on the ground right now, we're going to bring $10 billion of it back. The key is it's our most modern, up-armored, most sophisticated systems. In the totality of the Army, right now, our property book value is about $250 billion. So $10 billion doesn't, isn't that much in the law of large numbers. But as I said, most important stuff, and particularly our up-armored fleets that are there. So to reset all that, the great team at AMC and the Depot Partners, $6.2 billion. But that includes all the stuff that we already brought out, plus what was left over from Iraq. That's the rest. Actually, it's 4.2. Yeah, because we got – it's 4.2 from 15 out. Right, Chris? Yeah. It's going to cost us about a billion to $3 billion to bring it home. We really think it's going to come in on the lower number of $1 billion. Because frankly, the PAC G-Lock is opening back up. We're using a lot of green, uh, gray tails aircraft. So hopefully that's going to come in at about $1 billion. So for an investment of 6 plus 1, let's say $7 billion, we're going to ret retrograde and reset about 20 to $25 billion worth of stuff. Pretty good return on investment. Some people would say, why don't you just leave it there and buy new? There is no way we're going to get that kind of acquisition dollars. It's just not going to happen. Plus, then you got inflation. Because $20 billion that we bought five years ago is now cost you $28 billion or whatever it is. So uh, buyback readiness, uh, I'll talk a little bit more about that in, a, in the next slide. This rebalance to the Pacific, we're, we're working very closely with uh, USERPAC and PACOM and how do we put the right kinds of capabilities. Don't see a lot of force structure building up additionally in the Pacific uh, in terms of forces. There is some infrastructure work we got to do, particularly in in ammunition and logistics nodes, and we'll do that. We're looking at putting some Army preposition additional sets in the Pacific. We're working about where do we want to put it, Australia, uh, Guam, et cetera. Um, but we'll see where all that goes in the Pacific. But we will do a lot of exercises, a lot of regionally aligned forces, as I said. That's that, that's that next bullet. Uh, decisive action, regain full spectrum skills. So we've gotten very, very good at a certain band of capability and requirements in the Army over the past 12 years. It's been kind of coin-focused, been very SFAT-focused, training, counterinsurgency, that kind of stuff. But we became very FOB-centric, and, and you get some bad habits when you become FOB-centric. You become very sedentary, you become very, a lot of stuff ends up showing up. One example is this. So our, our MTOs in the Army are, with generators are built to conduct operations very dispersed in small groups, constantly on the move. So lots and lots of generators. What happens when you become FOB-centric? You get lots and lots of generators in one place. So something like 55% of the fuel that is consumed in Afghanistan is consumed by generators, producing power for talks, hospitals, defects, living facilities, gymnasiums, AFES, and I'm the vice chair of AFES, I'm not down on AFES, um, you know, barbershop, it just goes on and on and on. And the other thing it becomes is the FOB becomes Little Fort Hood. And one of the questions I'll, I'll pose next is, how good is good enough? How good does it have to be? What is that quality of life? In fact, Michael Williams, my LIA director, is doing a study with, to take a look at how do we determine. Look, if a commander wants to have lobster three times a day, okay. I mean, if that's what that commander thinks is the right thing for their troops, I'm not going to second guess that. What I, we need to be able to do is describe to that commander, if you say I'm going to eat three hots of lobster three times a day, what's the cost? And the cost is really in terms of how many containers are going to come in and all the transportation to do that, how many contractors is it going to take to do that, and then you can add in the dollar figure. And we've built a model, Mike and his team have built a model that can lay that out. Then a commander can make a decision. Because right now a commander on the ground in Afghanistan – can't see it. You know, you wake up one day and you're at a fob and you look around and go, where the hell did all this come from? It just shows up. You know, and everybody kind of adds to it. It's the additive effect. So be able to describe to a commander, if for this decision, for this size, you're going to get this, kind. you have to buy into this. You've got to buy into this tail. Then they can make an informed decision. Right now, they really can't. And, and that model's pretty well along. 
Um, but I go to every pre-command course, and I, I ask a question to all the brigade, battalion, and command sergeant majors. How many of y'all know what a ROM is? So let's see in this audience. Hopefully this is pretty much. How many people know what a ROM is? Yeah, that's a lot more than I get in the pre-command course. Then I ask, how many people have done a ROM in the last 10 years? Like I get two hands. Bob's here. Refuel on the move. Not a real complicated battle task, but it's something we did like that back in the, you know, airland battle days in Europe, you know, at Fort Hood, at NTC. It's just a skill set that we've lost. We'll get it back but we just haven't thought about it. I remember being in our scent and, uh, you know, the Iranians started to get a little froggy and we looked around and said, hmm, I wonder what our NBC readiness looks like. Most people would say, where is my protective mask? I think it's back in my wall locker at Fort Bragg. Where's our chemical companies? Oh, they're doing convoy security. Again, just a skill set. Uh, what about echeloning capabilities, logistics on the move? You know, jumping the BSA. That's another question I asked the P PCC guys. I get, the, I get the blank stare. Jump the BSA? You know, what, what is that? So I, those are the kind of skill sets we got to get back. Okay, here's, here's and I'll, I'll try to hit this because uh, I think I had about six minutes to start. Okay, next slide. So here's some big thoughts. And I'll just try to hit the wave tops here. So support to supporting relationships. I mean, we go crazy about AdCon and TayCon and MyCon and all that. It's about HandCon. It's about supporting to supported relationships. If we get over all that other crap, that can solve most problems. COCOM commander says, that's the supported component. Everybody else support them. What are your questions? I know it's, it's, it's easy to say, a little hard in practice, but it gets through a lot of these things. Habitual relationships. A lot of challenges there, particularly in the logistics field. We broke, we really broke a lot of our habitual relationships. Modularity, very powerful construct. But we may have taken modularity too far, and then when we were modularity and R4 Gen crossed, you know, we had some unintended consequences. And I'll give you one example why business rules sometimes are a problem. So when I was in Forces Command, we had a business rule that said, dwell rules all. And this was all about the leadership of the Army saying, we've got to protect dwell at all cost. This is when we were getting, you know, just spinning this fast going into Iraq and Afghanistan. So you would have a brigade at Fort Hood getting ready to deploy, let's say a logistics brigade, and it needed a battalion CSSB to go with it. And that CSSB had 14 months to well. Well, there was a battalion up at Fort Drum that had 16 months to well. So the brigade and the battalion at Fort Hood, who lived together, knew each other, fought together, trained every day together, we didn't take that battalion. We took the battalion from Fort Drum because it had more to well. So I asked you, what has more precedence, habitual relationships or dwell? And where's that break-even point? I think anything after a year of dwell, habitual relationships are much more important and maybe even a left of that. We've got to be very careful as we go in the out years that we don't let that break us. But you, you look and you go, how the hell did we get there? Okay, let me just hit the expeditionary deployability. 90% CONUS-based. Be very careful about the lessons we learned over the last 12 years. Which ones are good, which ones are not applicable in the future. How does a nation go to the war? The nation goes to war saying, we're going to go in fast, we're going to go in light, we're going to win, and we're going to come home. But what has it happened in our lifetime? We go in kind of light, and then all of a sudden we stay for a long time. And, and that ability to transition. So part of the, the structure we're trying to build with all those kinds of things you see below that, solution sets, is how do you reestat up and how do you reestat back down? See, I think our problem is not only getting into the fight, it's getting out of the fight just as quickly and just as effectively. That's part of our problem. It's one of the challenges why a lot of people are looked at the Army and go, ah, you're so big and it takes so long and you can't get out. That's why they call the Marine Corps. And I love the Marine Corps. But it's part of our challenge, you know, our staying power, how we are. So we've got to be more expeditionary, more mobile. Um, you know, a friend of mine, uh, Mike Fitzgerald, who used to be the uh, planner at CENTCOM during the run-up to OIF, remember the shock and awe piece of, of OIF? You heard that on the TV and all that. Mike Fitzgerald used to say the only shock and awe in the 1003 Victor plan, the invasion of Iraq, was when Secretary Rumsfeld saw the tip fit. It was 450,000 people at the far end. But are they going to flow a tip fit? Heck no. No political leader in the United States is going to flow the tip fit. You still got to build one because there's a lot of value in it. 
they're going to flow RFS, Request for Forces. Why? Because it gives them lots of political decision space. They can kind of meter it. That's how we're going to go to war. We really got to figure out how do we package it. For example, in our thing is maybe there's a fob in a box that's got all that capability, kind of maybe the force provider on steroids. We got to put the money in it. We got to have regional aligned forces. We're investing in a thing between the G3 and I partner, Rapid Expeditionary Deployment Initiative. We just briefed the vice, the chief on it last week. It's about getting back to EDRIs and CDRIs, using APS, investing in our infrastructure. It's something as simple as a unit having an air movements officer. Hey, what a novel idea. We lost that. Because everything was to deployment to a lad, which was a year out. What about the call that comes in at 2 a.m. in the morning? That's the call. Now, even if you got two weeks to deploy. We deployed a couple years back to Haiti. Didn't go real well. Okay, some things went very well, but a lot of it didn't. We're just not in that mode. We're in a mode to a year out. That we got to change. Um, how about loading equipment for ready to fight as opposed to admin? We load our ships and planes administratively. They go in, they go to, a, they go to an ISB somewhere, you reconfigure, you know, and then you move into combat. It's, it's efficient for transcom, but it's not effective. So how can you have a ready-to-fight platform as it comes off a ship or a plane and then load the ammo right as the last thing you do and fill your, fill your radios? Um, watercraft is key to this, and, and we're putting some investment back in Army watercraft around the littoral areas. We talked about APS. Here's a concept, combat-configured loads. Build combat-configured loads, Ted Case, back in sanctuary, you know, whatever kinds of capabilities you need, and then bring them in instead of trying to build all that infrastructure in the battle space. You know, again, you got to have airlift to do that, but even some C you could do combat-configured loads. And in a location, it doesn't require a lot of force protection. Uh, DLA, I think, is key to that piece. Tactical fuel. You know right now our main tactical fuel for most of our op plans is delivered by a thing called the Inland Petroleum Distribution System. You know how many miles you can lay a day with that with a quartermaster unit and an engineer unit? Two to four miles a day. The war will be over before we get the IPDS in. So uh, let's see, where's my G8? Michael Russell, G8 working really hard to get this thing called the Expeditionary Fuel Distribution System. It's basically a hose line. So we can lay it in at about 15 to 20 miles a day, and you can put side by side by side. So IPDS, really old technology. So Mike, thanks again publicly for working on it. Um, drivers of demand. So this kind of goes back to tooth to tail. So what's driving the size of the fuel? I mean, what's driving the size of the tail? It's power. So it's carbon fuels and batteries. We got to figure out how to drive that down, and, and by putting investment in platforms, soldier equipment, batteries, and also our contingency bases. And so we're infusing right now operational energy capabilities into our force providers. Everyone that gets reset by AMC. If there is a growth industry, I would tell you it's operational energy. My challenge is trying to convince the leadership to continue to invest in it. They're about it, but it's all about trade-offs. It is about ammunition. In many of our ammunition lines in Afghanistan, we've got 10 years of capability on the ground. It's because commanders don't trust us. And I got that. You know why? We don't have a good IT system. We don't have a good ERP for ammo. So I'm going to try to bring ammo into G Army so we can get an enterprise view. We put ammunition in the battlefield on PBOOS. It's our property book system. Doesn't work very well. Uh, it's about equipping solutions that are very boutique. Very unique kinds of capabilities. We've got to try to come to a sweet spot on that. Uh, I talked about maintenance, and I talked about quality of life. Um, operational reserves. What the United States Army Reserve and National Guard has done in the last you know, decade of combat is absolutely incredible. We've asked them to leave their jobs, sometimes with little notice, not knowing if the job would be there when they got back, and they stepped up to the plate. My concern is now we're going to put them back on the shelf and their readiness is going to go down and when we need them, they're not going to be there. We're going to be right back where we were in 2001. So there's a reasonable investment has to happen. As, as Jeff Talley says, the director of the Army Reserve, 39 days of training a year ain't going to get you an operational combat ready force. It is going to get you generally the individual soldier ready and that's about what they can do in 39 days. All the stuff the soldiers got to do, both their personal kind of readiness and medical and firing on the range and PT tests and all that. And then where do you get to unit training? Doesn't happen. Got to be more investment in there. It does concern me. Uh, 
here's a challenge we got. This is mostly for the uniform service, but if we got some commercial guys that can come up with a solution, this would be great. So when we went to modularity, one of the decisions we made is we got rid of, we gave every brigade everything. So we used to have things called ALO, right? ALO 1 through ALO 8. We used to have ERC A, Bs, and Cs, equipment readiness code A, Bs, and Cs, and we used to have authorized and required on the property book. All that's gone. We got rid of all of that when we went to modularity. No ALOs, right? So we took a, a, a vertical readiness stack with ALOs, and we laid it on its side as a horizontal readiness stack in R4 Gen. A unit that was an ALO 8 was going to become an ALO 1 at some point and then go back again, right? That's an expensive readiness model. We had OCO dollars. We could afford it. We can't afford that in the out years. So where is that balance between this stack and that stack? ALO is a four-letter word. Chief doesn't really want to go back to tiered readiness. But, you know, where do you find that sweet spot, you know, in transition? Do we go back to ERC Bs and Cs? Here's a challenge. If you're a tank battalion commander right now, your tank is obviously a pacing item. The ammo carrier that brings the ammo to the tank is an ERC A. So is the bayonet. Should a bayonet and a truck or a track equal the same? No, but that's our problem with readiness. Got rid of authorized and required. So we can't really see readiness, and we can't allocate readiness the way we'd like to. We're trying to figure out what is that right mix to come back to that. Um, and then the one in the cloud is really key, the, the visibility, the ERPs. I was in DLA when they fielded their ERP. Working pretty good, wouldn't you say, Ted? We're fielding G Army and our partners with Northrop Grumman and SAP going very, very well. A lot of it has to do with Kathy Miller, my deputy down front, that just is absolutely draconian on it. She's not, her face isn't, you know, she's got a sweet face, but she's tough, let me tell you. Um, that's going very well. That's the tactical. Uh, AMC's got the LMP, those two pieces. So we got the wholesale, we got the retail piece covered. We're about 30% into G Army for the warehouses. We'll bring in maintenance and property the next year. And then there's a number we'd like to bring in other capabilities, ammunition, aviation maintenance. Uh, what else, Kathy? A uh, APS, bring that in from AMC system. And you get an ERP that's got most of those logistics systems. Eventually, maybe down the road, food, fuel, those kinds of things. Uh, but that's going very, very well. But so it's visibility. Again, back to ammo. Commanders can't see it. So they don't trust the system, so they order more and more ammunition. And you know what those piles just continue to grow. Um, okay, I want to show one backup slide, and then I'll be done. Go, go forward a couple slides. One more. One more. That's our challenge. I showed this the other day at the uh, conference. So to my right, to your left, thus creating the mirror effect. This is an old crowd. I can do a young crowd. They got no idea what that is. Four count exercise done at a moderate cadence. I'll go to my left. So on the left there is a Humvee in 1999, right? If you were a company commander, you might have had a speaker and a radio. That's the vehicle on the right that we're fighting with. And there's an underlying thing there. Our vehicles have become fighting platforms. Larry, I'm not some, I don't think it's something we've really taken on as a, as a Dotlam PF. The vehicle, the Humvee, the MRAP, even HETS became fighting vehicles, kind of like the Bradley and the tank. I don't think our Army has really taken that on yet and really understood all the ramifications of a vehicle being a fighting platform. That's one underlying piece. But what I really wanted to talk about here is think about the maintenance, both at the unit all the way to the depot level of a vehicle on the left and a vehicle on the right. You know the one on the right is exponentially more expensive at every level of maintenance. Repair parts. You know what the driving, and most of you all know this, you know what the driving cost of the vehicle on the right is? Chris, what is it? It's software. It ain't even the hardware. The software costs are going like this. You guys got to help us with that. It's just unaffordable. We can't afford, another one, we can't afford to have every vehicle in the Army look like that. So that's the other thing we're trying to figure out is what vehicles are going to look like that and what vehicles are going to look like the one on the left. Really challenged. The G3 and the G8 are working their way through that. Tough thing to do. Need your help with that. Then there's an underlying leadership challenge because Corporal Mason, Sergeant Mason, Major Mason, they're used to the vehicle on the right. They come back home, we stick them in the vehicle on the left. They're like, what the heck is this? <laughs> you know, so there's a, there's a retainability issue, there's a motivation, issue, there's a whole leadership piece to that. Okay, go forward. That's my closing slide. I'll just go, no, I'm sorry. Go back. Go back to the uh, C-17. I, I stole this from General McDuffie. And so, the, you know, that's the kind of 
issue. We need people that think like that, okay? Not like the guy standing there because he's going to have a heck of a day. <laughs> but so the question is, you know, is that possible? And if you've grown up in the airborne world, you know, is that airdroppable? Well, hell yeah, anything's airdroppable once. So I don't know if that's possible, but how many people remember the Doolittle raid? Okay, the what, B-25s? We were attacked at Pearl Harbor. The nation was on its butt, thought maybe California would be invaded. Um, you know, what's gonna happen? You know, the morale of the nation was destroyed. So the president said, and with his military leadership, look, we gotta reach out and touch the Imperial Japanese nation. We gotta attack them. And so they came up with this idea to strip these B-25 downs. I think there were 18 or 19 of them and uh, fly in over the mainland of Japan, the island of Japan, and touch them. Tactically insignificant. Didn't do nothing. Strategically, huge message. We can reach out and touch you. That's the kind of thinking I think we need in the future. Uh, that kind of bold things. The thing that the vice talked about, don't have old think. You know, the computer, we might have a computer that weighs less than a ton. So, uh, again, my hat's off to AUSA. I will, I've been a member of AUSA. Actually, my dad told me to join it, and I did what my dad said. So, yeah, and I will continue to be a supporter and a member of AUSA uh, as long as I'm above ground. So, uh, God bless you all. Thank you very much. Uh, if I got any questions or not, I've burned a lot of green lights. So, okay, I'm done. Put a fork in me.